Hello. Our story begins on Coruscant inside the Jedi Temple. Anakin was inside the council chambers, a number of thoughts running through his head as he sat in silence. He didn't want to fail Padme, or lose her, and just as he believed he had a grip on the emotions surrounding the situation, he could hear Palpatine's voice telling him that the only way to save Padme was through him. It was a real kick in the chest. Anakin didn't know if he could just trust the Sith Lord. Skywalker turned around and faced the city, into the direction that Padme was in, and it felt like for the first time in his life, he could really feel her connection to the Force. This wasn't like anything he'd ever experienced with her before, but it felt so real for a moment. The words Palpatine was saying just etched itself across his mind and he almost turned around, but he stopped. Coldness filled his legs and he was glued to the floor. He in turn focused on his connection with Padme. It was so real, so intimate, and so human. For the first time in their relationship, they felt each other in a way they never had before. Anakin couldn't help but look into her direction with tears in his eyes. Of course, he didn't want to lose her. He would do anything to prevent that, but he stood here in this moment, focusing on his connection with her because he never wanted to let it go. Her presence was so soothing and warm. It was a perfect combination to soothe an uneasy heart, and he closed his eyes with a soft smile crossing his face. He could picture all he ever wanted in his eyes. All the fear and terror over parenthood and ditching adolescence behind approached, but then it was washed away with a calmness. He knew she wouldn't be able to hear him, but he mouthed the words, I love you, into her direction. Everything that was unnerving about their soon-to-be future vanished, and he knew that as long as they had each other, the challenges of leaving behind their youth and accepting such responsibilities would only become natural. Anakin wavered and he slowly made his way back down to the seat as he sunk down. The chair was so beyond comfortable and he found wholeness out of his closeness. His eyes closed and he could feel Padme's presence still with him and he envisioned their lives together. Padme referred to returning to Naboo to raise the child and that would be the perfect thing to do. He loved Naboo from the first moment he ever saw it. Spending time with her on Naboo was always a prize, and to face this new adventure, this new set of challenges together with her would only add to his love for the planet, not to mention the familial connection with their parents around and so forth. It was everything he could ever ask for. Anakin nestled down and all those fears he felt from Palpatine vanished, and he allowed the words that Yoda said to him give him that confidence. He began to trust himself to let go. It was a perfect feeling. He took control of his life. No one else had that control over him. He made this decision for himself. He had it all within his power and he owned it more than ever in this moment. He wouldn't go to the executive building. He would stay right here. Because as long as he and Padme had each other, then nothing bad would ever become of them or the life they had yet to lead. Anakin fell deeper into a meditative state and he couldn't just feel the warm soothing presence of Padme, but he could feel the stiffened peace from Ahsoka a galaxy away. She was loathing the idea of being a warrior and even felt some sense of confusion over the fact that she had fought again but there was some peace in the fact that the war would be over. Obi-Wan was still interlocked in battle in Utapau, and Anakin could feel Obi-Wan's focus on the battle. His determination was always such an inspiration during Anakin's training, and he let that wash over him. The peace and focus meshed so well with Padme's calm and healing presence, all of that being disrupted by cities crying out for help. Anakin didn't react. He firmed himself in the moment before it was silenced. His eyes shot open, and the council chambers were pitch black. There wasn't a light turned on, and so he looked at the cold and eeriness of the room, and then to the skyline of Coruscant, which initially had always been so beautiful, but now it felt deathly still. Anakin's heart slowly began to race, but then he reminded himself to let go. It wasn't letting go of Padme, he was releasing himself from the grip that Palpatine had. It was one that cost the Sith Lord his life at the hands of Mace Windu and Kit Fisto. Their efforts were not in vain, but Sidious, upon realizing that Skywalker was never coming, attempted a counter that only resulted in his death. The two Jedi Masters were just making sure everything was under control, which was harder than it sounded considering the security recordings had all been shut down before they arrived. But Mace Windu, as per usual, was in complete control of the situation. He had no fear of the Senate or what they would try and do. He would make sure the Jedi were totally valid for their move against the Chancellor, and why it would work. That would take time to explain away, but it would be alright. He would handle it all before Yoda returned to Coruscant. In the early hours of the morning, Windu would return to the council chambers, surprised to still see Anakin here. He kind of assumed that Anakin would have gone to bed, but he seemed in a state of mental peace. His eyes were closed as Mace walked in, and he didn't say anything once Windu sat down in his seat. The Master of the Order closed his eyes and fell through the force, and he could sense the calmness of mind that wrapped itself around Anakin. It made him happy. There was always a breach in their trust, and for the first time in their entire relationship, Windu felt like he could actually trust Anakin. It was a relief. He never wanted to not trust him. He believed that he was destined to bring balance to the Force, and his actions were a direct result of that. His student captured Darth Maul. His truth led to the death of Sidious, and his own work led to the death of Count Dooku. 
Anakin was entirely responsible for the downfall of darkness, and while the stench of the Clone Wars would still take time to remove itself from the galaxy, Anakin had done as Windu always believed he would do, which was bring balance to the Force. Mace got backed up and Anakin opened his eyes. Windu saw it from the corner of his own eyes as he turned to Anakin. Mace told Anakin that he didn't mean to disrupt him. Anakin just smiled, and Mace told him that he would like to present him with something. Anakin looked at Mace with confusion, but it wasn't much, just a token of respect. Mace walked over and handed Anakin a small box. It was beautiful, on the exterior and then on the interior was a small stone with ancient writing on it that Anakin couldn't read. Mace told him that it was a small token passed down from generation to generation. Every council member had held it, and since every council member was a master, it was a testament to Anakin Skywalker becoming a Jedi Master. Anakin looked up and smiled with excitement in his eyes. Mace told Anakin that he had done well. He earned the trust of the Collective Council, and they were grateful for his contributions to the Jedi Order and of course the greater galaxy. Anakin asked what the stone was, and Mace told him that it was from the birthplace of harmony and balance, where the Jedi originally came from. It had been all across the galaxy, Tython to Ak 2, Alderaan, all the way to Coruscant, where it had been for centuries and now belonged to him. The stone itself was carved with the words, The Force shall always be with me. Mace welcomed Anakin to the High Council, officially, before suggesting he get some rest as he turned and left the room. Anakin just looked back down at the small stone. Once he was done taking in the sight of the ancient relic, he got his way up and made his way to Padme's residence. She was already long asleep, so he joined her. He didn't get up until she was already at the Senate. Windu didn't sleep much the night before, but he was back inside the Senate building, explaining the actions of the previous night and trying to make sure the Jedi got out of the situation. Skywalker would, on the other hand, go into the temple and into the restricted section for the first time. The process wasn't all that exciting, and despite his access, he had the thousands of documents. He tired himself out quickly by siphoning through them for hours. When he was done, he went back to Padme's home. Some of the countless council members were returning from around the galaxy, so they were able to help Windu with his efforts. The big challenge was simply explaining themselves, because Palpatine had done so much damage to the reputation of the Order throughout the Clone Wars that they really couldn't do much to defend themselves. It was arduous, and it kept the Senate in session for forever. Padme was really struggling. It was stressful. Despite running a life as a full-time senator while being pregnant, she was also forming the initial steps required for creating a resistance to Palpatine. She had been at it since Mina Bonteri's death, and it was just a coalition of her closest allies that believed Palpatine was bad for the Republic. The delegation of 2000, which wasn't all in favor of her little alliance, did rally together against the rest of the Republic by siding with the Jedi. Of course, interest groups and corporations were heavily against the Jedi interweaving themselves into the Republic and even offing Palpatine, but what was done was done. Because Masameda was such a yes man, he was honestly content with just siding with the Jedi to move the process along. The debates would make them look weak and they were on the verge of winning the war. Why forfeit such a moment to aimless debates? Getting angry at the Jedi wouldn't bring Palpatine back. They needed to approach the end of the war before coming to a conclusion about the whole Jedi thing. The point was accepted and it allowed the Senate to move on. For days, nothing would change until Padme was taken to the emergency room and the upper class medical facilities on Coruscant. Anakin learned everything he could in a short amount of time. There was plenty of information, it just wasn't kept inside the archives on Coruscant. Yoda and the High Council a number of years back made certain knowledge impossible to obtain. The only way such information could be found is if someone went to the archive rooms on either Python or Ak 2. It was more so a preservation decision made when a group of marauders called the Nile became a large threat to the galaxy. The Jedi believed in their own ignorance that this group could have taken them out, when that was never a reality. So some of the information Anakin wanted was kept hidden even from masters. Regardless, Anakin felt confident that he could help her. As the whole process began, it went perfectly. Anakin was incredibly relieved. That is, until it stopped being perfect. On Mortis, the ones told Anakin that Padme was never meant to be his. While his actions may have allowed the Force to remain in balance, Padme and him were never meant to be. No matter what they did, all is as the Force wills it. Padme, after their children, Luke and Leia were born, began to suffer through some complications. It was unexplainable. She wasn't giving up, but her body simply began to fail on her. It was as if the children were far too much for her to bear, or in other words, the Force bond between brother and sister was far too much for an individual who had never possessed the Force to just have. The Force gave, but it also took, and Padme was never meant to make it through this process. Anakin tried to be with her, but as he resisted and tried to stay with her, by her side, she held his hand and told him that she would be okay. That was the last time he ever saw her. He was told to stay away as the medical droids did what they were programmed to do, which was save her life. Anakin was incredibly impatient. 
His worry continued not just for his wife, but for his children. He didn't want them to suffer either, but Luke and Leia were fine. Padme wasn't. She died not more than five minutes after being taken away from Anakin's side. The droids tried to bring her back to life, but every attempt proved to be futile. There was nothing they could do to bring her back to life. Anakin was informed moments after she flatlined. There was so much rage for Anakin, but it couldn't amount to the sadness he felt. He couldn't do anything. He was taken out of the picture and she died. The emotions swelled around him and he couldn't help but feel so lost. He did everything he could do to potentially save her and yet there was no saving to be done. Padme was gone. He lost her. Should he have trusted Palpatine? Should he have trusted the Jedi? What was he supposed to do now? Anakin sat in the medical facility silently for hours. He wasn't allowed to leave just yet. There was a whole process and now being that he was a widower, there were some extra steps the medical facility had to do. When it was all over after a grueling couple of hours, he took Luke and Leia home and put them to bed inside the room that had been designated for them. As they slept, he made his way into the living room and stood at loss. He just looked aimlessly around the apartment. It was so full of her life not more than a few hours ago. She was here and now she was not. He didn't know which way to direct his emotions. He could blame the Jedi, he could blame the Sith, he could blame himself, but all this blaming would only stagnate him. He wouldn't be able to grow or move beyond this loss if he continued to try and throw blame at anything. Death was a natural part of life and he had to accept that he couldn't control it. Anakin paced around the room, his heart in his stomach, his eyes swollen from shedding so many tears and yet he was left with what he believed to be nothing. He slipped and fell down into the couch and let out a terrible sigh. He felt so weak and vulnerable and he had no one by his side. This built up a rage within him and he grabbed the side table and stood up with it and dragged it above his head, slamming it down into a glass table beneath him. The sound of the shattering glass on the table woke up the children and his head tilted over quickly. This only broke his heart more. In his shambles of a mindset, he took this as him scaring his children because he was breaking things and being aggressive in the room away from them. A terrible shame ran through his veins as he quickly made his way into the other room. Luke was crying and it woke up his sister. Anakin apologized to them like they could understand what he was saying and he picked them up, giving them the comfort he believed he should give them. It took time but they slowly fell back to sleep and they put the babies back to bed. Anakin slid to the ground outside their little beds. Despite the parents not knowing it would be twins, Anakin asked 3 to pick up a spare bed and have R2 help him assemble it once he learned that there were twins. Anakin just looked over at the two of them, sleeping and his hands creased over his head. He couldn't keep doing this. He couldn't keep being angry and powerful because as a father now, he had to have the strength to be gentle. Aside from Obi-Wan, he didn't really have anyone to look up to. He only knew Qui-Gon for like three days, and there wasn't a whole lot to take from their time together. So instead, Anakin thought back on the one person he knew who knew how to go through such circumstances. A chill ran through his body as he realized he was facing the same challenges as his mother. He would have to be like her and raise two kids on his own. The respect he had for her only doubled, and how much he missed her did the same. Anakin had no more tears to shed, but he would get it. He had to, because if he didn't, then he wouldn't be able to raise his children. This was such a terrible fear for him. He knew what it was like to worry about a Padawan, but this was so much different. These were two beings that were solely dependent on him, and if they couldn't depend on him, then who else? Anakin knew he needed support, and so he went to sleep knowing that in the morning he would have to find him. When the morning came around, he reached out to Ahsoka, who was already on Coruscant, having delivered Maul over to the Jedi. When she arrived, she could see how much of a wreck her former teacher was in. While Padme's death did make news, it wasn't really picked up by the tabloids and such, being that she died during one of the largest political scandals of all time. Was it really a scandal? Not really, but it was newsworthy, and the press ate up the coverage of the Jedi's hostile takeover of the Republic, which wasn't really happening. The few close friends to Padme knew about her death, but they were also unaware of the closeness between her and Skywalker. They, despite the obvious, didn't realize that she was pregnant, so none of them knew any of this was happening. In the Senate, it didn't really matter. Representative Binks rose to the occasion to fill her role in, which meant he had access to both the Nebu representative and Senate locations on Coruscant. But before Ahsoka could come and see Anakin, Jar Jar told Skywalker that there'd be no issues. He could keep both residences so Anakin could stay where he was without risking anything. Jar Jar wanted to make sure he could take care of his friend. Ahsoka, when she arrived, learned about the children and the marriage and everything there was to know. But she had never seen Anakin in such a state before. He was so ghostly, so disconnected. There was a semblance within him, but it wasn't him. It was just a man who didn't really have the words to process at all. His anger had decided, but it was mostly because he was afraid of waking up his children or scaring them. This only hurt him in the long run because he was suppressing an already rigid set of emotions. They built up inside of him alongside their grief 
and the feeling of no control, and when Ahsoka was with him, he didn't say it directly, but it was obvious when they talked with each other. Ahsoka felt terrible for him, but she couldn't really do anything. She was just a kid. She gave him a couple suggestions, like going back to Naboo to live with Padme's family, and that didn't seem like a terrible idea. Considering the funeral was coming up, he might as well. Their talk ended with a hug, and Ahsoka suggested that he try and get Obi-Wan involved. Maybe he would be of assistance. Despite how much Ahsoka loathed the council, she didn't absolutely hate Obi-Wan. She was disappointed with the secret mission that Anakin was put onto, but in hindsight, with Palpatine being the Sith Lord, she couldn't really be all that mad about it. Anakin didn't. Reaching out to her was hard enough as it was. What made it worse was a couple of council members that would be attending the funeral, most specifically, Obi-Wan and Yoda. Mace was still holding down the fort inside the Senate, but he would have been there too. Anakin was expected to be there. Despite how obvious the romantic connection, everyone knew Padme and Anakin had been close friends since they were just kids, so naturally he was expected to be there. The twins were kept away from the ceremony simply because the family understood that Anakin wanted to keep things private until he felt ready, which was kind of them to do for him. The two droids were left behind to take care of them while the funeral happened. Anakin was allowed to be a part of the procession, and as he was with them, he wore the robes over his head. The Jedi who were present were on the side, with Bail Organa and Mon Mothma, among others who were close with Padme. The procession was the most painful thing of Anakin's life. He just walked along with everyone until everyone was gone. Anakin was the last one by Padme's side. As he sat there in silence, surrounded by the beautifully picked Mali flowers and the Queen's heart flowers, they were brought here just for Padme's funeral. As Anakin sat there, a slight rain began to fall, and he was covered in a warm embrace of a summer's downpour. He spoke to the casket as if she could still hear him. He knew she could. When he was in the council chambers, he knew she could always hear him. Even if it wasn't the most concrete or direct wording, she always knew. Anakin just told her that he wished he could save her, and how he knew that wishing was no longer an option. It was a mature understanding of what he had to be now. So before he sat in silence, he promised her that he would raise their children the right way. It was evening when the funeral was held. While the rain covered up the remainder of the sunset, a number of streetlights turned on and lit up the area around him. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka were standing in the open halls of an older building, talking with their robes over their head. Yoda had left, being that he was needed inside the Senate for another session with Chancellor Arcana, who had been given the mantle for the meantime, just due to his massive popularity. Ahsoka told Obi-Wan that he should be the one to go over and talk to Anakin, and Obi-Wan agreed. The two of them had just come to the conclusion that Ahsoka would rejoin the Jedi Order. It wasn't an easy decision for her, but Obi-Wan gave her some insight into the inner workings of the High Council and some of their plans moving forward. She liked the direction and agreed to rejoin the Jedi as a Jedi Knight, which was still on the table despite her feelings about the whole thing on Mandalore. Obi-Wan came up behind Anakin and sat down in the rain. Anakin looked over and he didn't say anything, truthfully waiting for Obi-Wan to say something, but he didn't say a thing. He knew what it felt like, the hopelessness, the lack of control. It wasn't easy to let go, especially when something was so far out of one's control. But unlike Obi-Wan and his loss of Satine, he would be here for Anakin. But not a word needed to be said. Obi-Wan sat close enough to Anakin where he could reach over and put his hand on Anakin's shoulder, just to let him know it would be okay. Anakin was out of tears, but the rain slipped through his robes and made up for it. As small streaks of rain crawled down his face, Anakin's hands were holding each other, and the two of them sat in the pouring rain for hours. But they were with each other, and that was more than being alone which is all that really mattered. At some point, Anakin realized that he could no longer sit here and he got up. His robe still drenched as he leaned over and kissed the casket and told her that he'd always love her. Obi-Wan was waiting for Anakin as he turned around and the two of them started walking away. During the walk, they shared a few words and Anakin expressed that he would likely not be returning to the temple for the time being. Obi-Wan kind of assumed. He knew there was a deeper connection between Padme and Anakin and he had no intention of interrupting that. He told Anakin that he would inform the council that he took a bearish vow. It would give him all the time he needed, and he would not be bothered by the council or by anyone else, which meant that Anakin wouldn't learn about something that happened in the following days. Skywalker, on the other hand, was given permission to live with Padme's family, which they already adored him anyways. They were kind and compassionate and loving to him. They treated him like family since the first time they ever met him. It was really nice for Anakin, and he enjoyed it, but the hole in his heart was massive. When he wasn't the main person taking care of the twins, he was out, usually in the mornings, meditating. He would go on long hikes in the early hours of the morning when it wasn't light out, and he'd find a remote location on the planet to find his peace. He knew that there was nothing he could do, and his main fear, the one greater than anything, was failing his children. He couldn't be full of rage and expect his children to come out any different. He had to accept that not everything could be controlled, and what comes must be allowed to pass. These Jedi hikes and meditations were food for the soul. It wasn't him trying to avoid being a parent, it was him teaching himself how to be the best version of himself he could be, which was more challenging than he could have ever believed. But he did it, 
He called upon the forest and reached out for peace and harmony. He pushed himself to the limit, digging into the forest in a way he never had before. This was because Anakin never let himself go. He always held on with a tight grip. He didn't know how to let himself open up, not even to the force. His entire life was hiding away from opening up and letting go. Now, he had to do it, and if it weren't for Luke and Leia, he wouldn't have. They filled his mind most of the time, regardless of the beautiful location he found himself home at. He was always thinking of the two beings he loved more than anything else in the galaxy. He wanted to be perfect for them, but he feared falling short at every turn. Though when he meditated and he allowed himself to fully let go, his heart was filled with a fullness he hadn't yet felt since he had last heard Padme's voice. Anakin learned atop the mountains and by the seas that it was better to have had than to never have had it at all. That could be translated to having loved her for the time that he did rather than not at all. Because regardless of what he had now, those memories were never going anywhere. So instead of dreading the moment he came to peace with what was, his soul became a wave in the greater force that existed within him, and in the moment and harmony with the world he was attached to, he found the peace that he never had before. It was a magnetic moment, but when it happened, he never felt more alive. It was extraordinary. It took months upon months to get to this point, and he had visited Padme's burial site a number of times since her death. But slowly, the time between visits became less frequent. It wasn't a lack of love or a loss of care. It was life goes on. Luke and Leia were fully talking by this point, and their real connection lay within their father. While Padme's family was great to have around, nothing to them compared to Anakin. This, of course, only added to the family's adoration of Skywalker. It was all in the eyes. Luke and Leia only looked at their father that way. He was what they wanted, and they were all he ever needed. When he came into balance within himself, he knew that he could be who his children needed him to be. But he was already that. He never needed to change himself to be what they needed. But the conscious decision to make himself better was a difference maker. It wasn't that he wasn't enough before, but his fear of not being enough would only make him a better person and a better father. The happiness Anakin had only continued to uplift his spirit. Then the day came when Anakin would take his children to where he had found his peace. While Anakin's bearish vow could last as long as he wanted, he knew that he would likely not be returning to the Jedi Order. Instead, he'd build himself a monastery for the time being so that he and his children could live atop the mountain that Anakin found his peace at. The name he called it was a bit cheesy, but it worked. He called the mountain Mount Amidala. Naboo had one rule, if no one had scaled a mountain before, then the person who did could name it, so he named it after his queen. Luke and Leia's first time to the top of the mountain as infants wouldn't be as memorable as one would think, but it was alright, the feelings they felt being so intertwined with the force would stick with them for a lifetime. Both children were so susceptible to the force, and being on top of the mountain with dad allowed them to feel everything he felt when he came. His openness allowed his emotions, from the good to the bad, be felt by both children. This wasn't bad, nor would it eventually be bad. It allowed them to understand their father in a way no one else up until this point in his life had. Anakin spent a couple months mastering the forest in his own way, in which he constructed the monastery, and then he brought his children to the top of the mountain to join him. At this point, he'd be visited by Ahsoka, who was coming here not as a Jedi, but as a friend. She told him everything that had happened since he had been gone. Nothing too deep about the Jedi aside from that one incident that happened shortly after Padme's funeral. Ferris Afi had been broken out of prison by a disgruntled temple guard. Neither of them had been seen since. Balin's skull had been sent on a task force to capture them. The main consensus was, Anakin didn't need to worry about it. Ahsoka also told Anakin about Obi-Wan taking on a new student, and the fact that he'd been leaving messages behind for Anakin. Skywalker hadn't picked it up, and Obi-Wan knew he hadn't, and probably wouldn't for a while. But Ahsoka told him that whenever he felt like he was ready, there were a number of messages for him. Not just from Obi-Wan, but a couple of others. Four or five from Ahsoka, two of them from Plo Koon and Shakti, one from Mace Windu, and another one from Yoda. These messages weren't anything negating his feelings about the Barish Vow. Rather, they were just encouragement. But Ahsoka didn't want to spoil anything. She was happy to see how happy Anakin was, and also how big Luke and Leia were. They were still basically infants, but they could walk, which was troubling enough for Anakin, especially on a mountain. But they were well behaved. The two good friends talked for hours and they sat atop the monastery when the sun fell behind the mountains. Luke and Leia were put to bed and Anakin met Ahsoka at the top of the monastery. They talked about everything. Anakin learned about the fourth year of the Clone War, which was more or less just elongated skirmishes, and the ascension of Bail Organa from interim to full-time chancellor. As the two of them talked, rain started to fill the air, and the two of them started talking about Anakin's personal journey and how Ahsoka's time with the Jedi had gone. It was a perfect talk, it was really warm. Despite the cool air surrounding the monastery, the warmth of their talk, and the light surrounding them made their conversation all the more peaceful. 
They were the best of friends, and as close as they were to brother and sister, this was everything they needed. Ahsoka was unsure of her stance on being a Jedi. While there was change within the Order, she wasn't fully confident with her decision to do what she had done. But Anakin, just as he would have when they were Master and Apprentice, assured her of her choices and reminded her to stay the course. The conversation shifted and changed throughout the night, from laughing until their stomachs were in twists, to sharing theories about the universe, all the way to memories of their time as Master and Apprentice. It was perfect. In the morning, Anakin walked with Ahsoka to her shuttle, which was parked right outside the monastery, and watched as it flew into the air and vanished. Anakin walked into his room and grabbed his Jedi communicator, and walked out to the tip of the mountain, where he found his peace. He knelt down and listened to the recordings. He heard the first one all the way up to the most recent one from Obi-Wan. The first few were easy to make it through, but they started to become more difficult when they passed by. Obi-Wan dearly missed Anakin, but he didn't want to come out here because he knew how important the step in Anakin's life was to him. If he interrupted it, he could ruin it. Every day there were messages of encouragement followed with a little haiku Obi-Wan had written when he was most confused or lost in certain parts of his life. If he didn't read one of those little poems or haikus, he was telling a memory they both shared, or just ones he had with Qui-Gon, knowing how much Anakin loved those stories. There wasn't a single day that Obi-Wan missed. Strewn in with the messages were uplifting words from Shock, T, Plo, Koon, and Yoda. The message that Windu sent had Anakin in tears, as if the ones before didn't do that to him as well. It was Windu's pride in Skywalker, because Anakin did what many others would hide from doing. Anakin's strength of heart had always been an inspiration to many on the council, and Anakin should never forget what made him him. Despite the struggles and disagreements, he always knew that Anakin had the strength and determination to bring balance to the Force. When Anakin was done with his listening, he went back to take care of his children. He would teach them everything he learned himself over the coming years. Luke and Leia would be raised into a loving home that Anakin had built himself. They would come to learn stories about their mother and even get to visit their family down below the mountain. Luke and Leia had such a grasp on the Force, and it was a lot of it in part to the care that Anakin took in giving them the knowledge of it. By the time the twins were 10 years old, they were incredible with the Force. Their knowledge was only a fraction of what their father had yet taught them. Over the years, they had developed a keen understanding, and they practiced heavily with each other. While by this point the Jedi were unaware of this breach to their code, Anakin was given permission to go to Ilum alone. Of course, by alone, it meant bringing Luke and Leia to get their kyber crystals. Anakin had also taken them to Andrillion, Latour, Jedi, and Lothal. Luke and Leia were very smart because of their father, and they followed him in his footsteps religiously. As they descended the mountain to meet with Padme's family for a picnic, something seemed off. Anakin wasn't too worried about it, but once they arrived at the villa, he was slightly concerned. He told Luke and Leia to go to the treehouse and hide, and keep an eye out. They had their weapons in case they needed them. The brother-sister duo was quick to react as they ascended their treehouse, and they hid. They could see two hooded individuals inside the courtyard sitting next to the family. They almost acted, but Anakin walked out, and he told the two hooded individuals that they didn't need to do this. It was Grand Inquisitor and Barriss. They tried expressing that he destroyed their lives. Grand Inquisitor was meant to lead the new empire, and Barriss was thrown into prison for doing the right thing. They spent ten years searching for him. If it wasn't for this little Padawan, then they would have had Maul by their side too. Anakin just looked at them and asked if they were done. Barriss ignited her lightsabers, and so did the Grand Inquisitor, both of them ready to strike. Anakin lifted his hand ever so gently, and he shook his head. The two of them were stuck in place as they tried to strike down the family. Anakin stepped forward and told them to give up now. Barriss' face tensed up as she tried to swing forward more, but she was caught up again, thrown backwards along with the Grand Inquisitor. Anakin told the family to run as he ignited his pure lightsaber. They looked at him as the family ran past. Barriss launched off the ground, ready to exact a decade-long revenge. But Anakin swiftly spun away from her, only acting in defensive moves. His offensive form, the one that made him such a monster during the Clone Wars, was no longer his primary form. Grand Inquisitor leapt up, but he was also no match. It wasn't even fair. Anakin moved around them like a blur. In the treehouse, Luke and Leia playfully shoved each other, watching in pure awe as her father worked like a true master of the Force and the Blade. He was remarkable with the skill. The two attackers were slain within a number of seconds. They couldn't compete, let alone compare. They were extinguished, and Anakin turned around to use the Force to close the blinds on Luke and Leia's treehouse. Once everything was cleaned up, the picnic resumed. A topic of conversation between the two children and their father was whether or not he would get them a new mother, but he often joked back, asking if he wasn't good enough. This was always taken with a lighthearted laughter. Truthfully, Anakin never felt such a desire. Maybe when they grew up, but at the age they were right now, all he cared about was taking care of them. Shortly after the incident, Obi-Wan came and visited the monastery, and to say he was impressed was an understatement. He informed Anakin that the council still left his seat open for him for whenever he wanted to return, and Anakin was thankful. 
Of course, Obi-Wan had no mention of the children to the council. It wasn't his business. But the twins loved when one of Anakin's friends came along. Uncle Kenobi was their favorite, especially Leia's favorite. She bonded really well with both of them. Not for nothing, both Obi-Wan and Anakin were girl dads. Rex and Ahsoka were Luke's favorites. Rex was just great to banter with, and Ahsoka was, well, she was Ahsoka. It was one big happy family, all the time. Anakin did make sure his children were able to have schooling, and once they were about 12 years old, they were allowed to go to a private school near the villa. It was something that Padme's family had been going to for years. Luke and Leia were familiar with the other kids, and they were known as a family from the mountain. The twins were relatively popular, and having sleepovers on the mountaintop was a dream. All of Luke's friends loved Anakin because he was a cool parent, and all of Leia's friends adored Anakin because, well, he's eye candy, plus he's the cool parent. With such a connection to the Force, Luke and Leia were able to know what they wanted to do with their lives for the longest time. Luke knew he couldn't become a Jedi, but he wanted to start an order with his father, one that allowed everyone from across the galaxy to be a part of it. Anakin didn't want to start a new order. He still had his love for the Jedi, but he would help Luke start his, which led them to building a similar monastery on the mountain adjacent to Mount Amidala. They built a connector bridge to the other mountain. That was tight and secure at least. Once Luke was 18, he and R2 went out to look for people who wanted to join. Didn't have to be force sensitives, just people. He wanted to bring anyone in and teach them the force, but not just that, how to harmonize with the universe. Leia was so similar to her mother, she wanted to help people. And while she had no interest in being a queen, by the time she was 18, she was a senator, just like her mother. Both Luke and Leia went by Amidala in the public eye to keep up the ruse for Anakin, because as his children went out into the galaxy to start their own lives, he returned to the Jedi Temple as a hero of a long gone era. The council had seen some change with new faces present and old faces gone, but it was where he wanted to be. Though because of his Barish vow and his new lightsaber, the council suggested that he lead an instruction class for Jedi who wanted to have a similar grasp on the Force which did include Anakin bringing a couple of council members who were interested to his monastery. It was at this point where the council kind of figured out what was going on. But why force Anakin to change when he brought balance to the force with a wife and a child on the way? Or children on the way. Also, Luke and Leia were liked a lot. Being children of Anakin and Padme were kind of doing that for them, but their personalities were also vibrant and adored. The council didn't remove Anakin, but only encouraged him. As a respected master on the council of 20 years, despite the bearish vow, to teach others on how to do what he did, how to be like the Chosen One. So he didn't. Master Skywalker may have been one of the youngest, but the loss of those around him encouraged him to be one of the wisest Jedi seen in generations. He still missed Padme and he did go on a couple dates after her death, but he knew where his place was, being the father to Luke and Leia Skywalker, as they now call themselves openly, and being a Jedi Master inside of the Reborn Order. And that, my friends, is our wholesome PP story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Woo 670, Annika Stank Runner, CT 7567, Oz of Oz, Darth Nox, The Eternal Padawan, Jenna Naguin, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kallik, Youngly Slayer 66, Madman Studios, Anakin 003, Fortis Legacy Star Wars, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, Many First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash the like button. If you want to see other things, go check out the Patreon. There's cool things on there. Otherwise, let's talk about this real quick. So we've done Anakin never turns to the dark side, and I thought the idea of having Padme die after he decided not to turn to the dark side would be an interesting concept. And I think having Anakin be a father on his own was also kind of different and would be fun to work with. And I think Anakin would just, I think he would thrive as a dad. I think he'd be a really good father, honestly. Like his fear of being the bad guy or being like this negative influence would probably override his his anger and his rage and allow him to actually kind of fill into that role naturally. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, you know what to do. I love you all. Spread the love and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.